What I'd like to do is give a short presentation that gives background to the game Tug of Logic. Tug of Logic is just one game exemplifying philosophy sport, which are games for social reasoning and public deliberation. Some background very briefly. This all grew out of my participation in Cafe Philosophy, which is public participatory philosophy. There was a problem with it in that people came to more or less hear themselves and not really to interact. People were very nice to each other, but weren't very critical about their own thoughts or each other's thoughts. So inspired by a philosopher named uh, Anthony Layden, the concept of social reasoning, reasoning as a conversation rather than as a like a mathematical proof or that sort of thing, I developed the idea of philosophy sports. I developed a number of norms, which I won't go over here in detail, that a facilitator would need to follow in order to create the kind of social reasoning, a responsive, engaged kind of reasoning that Leighton and others have been talking about. So I came up with the idea of philosophy sports, which are live, facilitated, device-mediated, internet-mediated games for competitive persuasion in which players attempt to convince participants, called gamesters or other players, of the truth of some main claim, a controversial claim, by entering distinct and revisable reasons in play and subjecting them to the scrutiny of all those participating. The idea is we somehow measure the level of persuasion and provide that information as a kind of social feedback. But the game is usually won not by getting people to accept your position by realizing you have to change your own. So I'm going to look at one particular game. It's not Tug of Logic. It came before Tug of Logic and it's simpler in certain ways, but it involves many of the same devices and concepts and it'll allow me to illustrate the kind of dynamic, the, the room dynamic, the people in the room, how they respond to this kind of game and how the game responds to them. That's what I want to show what it's supposed to be like through this presentation. So the game I'm going to be talking about is called Make Your Pitch. As you can see here, there's a place for the main claim to be entered that the facilitator would enter, and there's a place to give it a quick one minute poll. You want to get a, a sense of the temperature of the room, what people in the room already feel about the main claim. So here are some characteristics of the main claim. It should be controversial. The idea is that the speaker really believes in it. It's their position, not just something they've heard about. And they think others disagree, but others shouldn't disagree. They don't think it should be controversial, even if it is. Uh, and they're trying to persuade others to accept what they say. To take an example from Plato, in fact, suppose someone steps up and says that justice is in the interest of the strongest party. So a quick poll is done on this, a one minute poll, and it's found that only 23% of the people in the room agree with the claim. By far, most people are not yet persuaded. This is in fact an eligibility requirement for a main claim. That is, most of the people must disagree with it. That's the definition of a controversial claim. The main claim is something that most people in the room disagree with. We'll also do a similar poll like this at the end. And this also happens in effect in the Tug of Logic app that at the end there will be another poll and the and key will be the difference between the initial straw poll and the final poll. That difference in percentage points we can call the glory points. But you can't win with glory points. As I said, you really win by changing your own mind. Now this is what it you know, might look like in the straw poll. The uh, main claim is put out to people. The facilitator can revise it. So this is what people get on their phones, for example. They see how much time there is remaining and they just have to click convinced or not yet persuaded, up or down. After that, what takes place in both Tug of Logic and in this game is a series of bouts of logical scrimmage. So these are facilitated discussions of people in the room or you know people online regarding not the main claim now but 
particular reasons that are put forward. Each bout of logical scrimmage deals with a particular reason. So let's go through some of these based on what happens in Plato's text. Importantly, there is voting and there is a timing function during these bouts of logical scrimmage, but they're quite different. The timing is open-ended. The duration is to be determined by the facilitator. Key in the bout of logical scrimmage is a display. The social feedback element is really only going to be visceral when it's visible in some sense. So I've just got a mock-up little dial here. And so let's go through this. So the first premise, suppose, says that the ruling party is the strongest party. So we've got a conclusion about the strongest party. So we need to say what we're talking about, the strongest party. We don't mean muscular strength. We mean the ruling party, the party that can pass the laws. And a vote is done on that. Some discussion after 13 minutes, suppose, 83% of the people think that's reasonable enough. So at this point, that bout would be declared over and the emerging common ground is displayed. So, and the score for that element. And with each bout of logical scrimmage, a new reason in play will be entered. And if it gets established, then it joins this ground. So the idea is to build up this common ground of agreed upon propositions and hopefully they will imply the conclusion in question. So let's go now to the second one and see what else can happen. Now in this case, the reason in play is the ruling party passes laws in its own interest. Now watch what happens. Now most people thinking about this would probably say, yeah, that's probably what would happen. That's about what would happen. And so after a few minutes of discussion, we have almost everybody agreeing that it's true. But now suppose that somebody says, well, what is meant here? Do, does it mean that they will pass laws that are actually in their interest or just what they think will be in their own interest, in their perceived best interest? And now this thought may cause a great deal of doubt in people's minds. And so what can happen is the person advocating this claim, the main player advocating this claim, can choose to edit the reason in play. The reason in play is always revisable and changeable and the consequence may be that more people agree or less people agree. So in this case let's imagine that the player holds their ground and says no I this is exactly what I mean. So everybody else is thinking well it might be their perceived best interest it might not be actually their, their best interest. So what can happen next? The person digs in their heels Everyone has a chance to reconsider and re-vote, and this can happen. So this is the key effect that I want to see. And I've seen it happen in the classroom, where someone brings up a, a subtle distinction that people hadn't been thinking about before, and the result is complete change of mood of the room. So that needs to be fed back at a social level to have a public event. The graphic display of this is very important and hopefully it looks better than this uh, ripoff of a Democrat Republican kind of thing. So um, now uh, if this is what happens and there's only 21% in this live voting at nine minutes in there's only 21% of the people present who agree with the claim then this is getting ready to die. There are various things can happen, however, at this game. So for one thing, the player can rescue the situation by saying, okay, okay, I meant perceived best interest and try that option and said they put that in there and we see, you know, perhaps it jumps back up again. So let's now promote this to the ground and finish this round. And you can see it up here now. We've got the ground it has two premises in it. Now we have a third one. Notice very quickly, we don't have any premises here about justice. The main claim is about justice, and it's about interest of the strongest party. Well, we've got something about the interest of the strongest party. Well, actually, the perceived interest, and that big difference is going to be a problem for the argument. But be that as it may, those chickens aren't coming home to roost yet. Now let's suppose that the third premise, which is the one that will link these three 
to this conclusion, justice is following the law. See, because if justice is following the law and the law is in the interest of the ruling party and the ruling party is the strongest party, then justice is the interest of the strongest party. That's the way it's supposed to go. But now people think justice is following the law? Uh, what if it's a terrible law? If it's a terrible law, to follow this law is certainly not going to be justice. So I imagine in this room, not many people would be uh, supporting that 32%. And at this point, if nothing else happens, there's no reason to go on to the final poll, which illustrates a key rule. Every reason in play must be established by some predefined majority for the game to proceed to the final poll. At least that's how it happens in Make Your Pitch. So if the player can't establish it, the game can end. Or, now here are some other options I was playing with. I don't think we need this, but that, that you'll see that the technology for either Tug of Logic or this game is basically a management of lists. The list that becomes the ground that it needs to be presented to uh, all the players so that they see the building consensus and see if they think it's sufficient to prove the conclusion or not. So I imagined also this idea of a parking spot, which is really in the background, maybe only seen by the facilitator. And it's a way to park a premise so that the player can go on and maybe come up with other reasons. For example, if this player had started with this premise, they might not have gotten very far. So they might have to park it and go back to the other ones and then see if they could come back to it. Also, the idea of a list of propositions that the facilitator might elevate to a reason in play is a useful device to think of in the background. It might even be possible for players to be able to input their suggested reasons for the main player to advance as a reason in play to sort of help them out to get where they want to go. So the idea of the quiver or the uh, ready supply of suggested reasons in play that may be put into play for its own bout of logical scrimmage may be a useful technology in the background to keep in mind for technical development for later. The other possibility, of course, is that the player drops the reason in play, and that is to say they come to think that it is now false. Perhaps through the discussion that happens, they see, you know what, I should never have said that. Justice is not following the law. I made a big mistake. And then if they withdraw that and, in effect, argue against their own reason in play, they are ending the bout of logical scrimmage, but also changing their mind, and thus it's a kind of little win. If it's so important that they realize that, you know what, I was wrong about the main claim too, that's the point at which the game has to show or celebrate that someone has changed their mind and uh, has uh, won. There might be also a drop list for things that are dropped that perhaps different than a quiver list, or perhaps it's one list that are marked in different ways, something like that, an alternative background list. I just wanted to show you uh, finally to wrap up. Something like this is what I imagine the players would see on their phones during the third bout of logical scrimmage, okay? So they've got justices following the law right there, and they vote by clicking either established or contested. You can see, as in the last slide, so far there is only 27% voting in support of it. And down here, presumably, they would also see a running summary. They would see the list that are the grounds. Perhaps they would have an option to enter a possible reason in play there. And a reminder, of course, of the main claim. Somehow seeing the ground list close to the main claim so that you can see do all these premises together line up to support and to prove, as it were, that, that uh, main claim. All right. And maybe there it's imagined functionality that is not part of the uh, prospectus for the tug of logic, but it may be useful to, if players can somehow signal that this emerging list of commonly agreed upon propositions is 
getting to be a proof of the main claim that they're somehow a signal that they're ready to change their opinions, it may help the facilitator to decide that the bout of logical scrimmage is time to end. And finally, this is what I showed earlier, the uh, straw poll, the initial poll, perhaps what it looks like for players, and as well at the end, the final poll and an ability to compare what happened earlier to what happened before. So somehow this should be a compelling graphic as this is clearly not in order to indicate the change in the game status. All right, so that's the presentation. I wanna thank you very much for considering this, for working on this in your groups. And I'd like to make myself available if there's anything I can do to help or to advise or to assist in any way, I'd be glad to do that. Thanks very much. for each of these boards, and you can play uh, for that topic. What you'll need to do next is write out a reason for or against that main claim or topic that is on the sheet. So, so first pick a topic, a game will be organized around one of the main claims. And to start to play, everybody needs to write one reason for or against the main claim. And then we can get started with the actual play. So you need a game piece, index cards, read the instructions, and uh, choose a topic. Two is put a reason in play, which means we're going to put it in the middle, and then we're going to start arguing on two things. So first, we're going to try to figure out if we think the sentence written is true or false. And the second question, which is a separate question, is we're going to ask, okay, now that we agree perhaps on whether it's true or false, does it fully support the main claim? So let's start with a, a reason from someone who is on the main claim true side, which I believe it's you, right? Are yeah. oh, you in the middle? I'm sorry. It's you. I will be. So let's start with yours. Can you read it uh, for us, please? Yes. Um, public shaming is a reasonable form of teaching a lesson because it teaches people that what they did wasn't right. Let's focus on the part which is after the cause. Okay, do you mind reading it again just so that we're, because, uh, sorry, the first part is the main conclusion, right? So we're going to ask. What follows the one because is it true? Okay, um, it, teach, it can teach the person that what they did wasn't right, and it teaches others not to follow suit and do what that person did. Okay, so they all do right. So let's put it in here. Yeah. Let's split it in two because there are two terms, in fact. The first is. It teaches people that what they did is wrong. Do we agree with that? That's, that's not, I don't know if the, I see your point definitely, that's important in a situation, but it, in, a, in a general situation, we're just talking about in general whether it needs to be acceptable. Perhaps you can rephrase it and you'll tell me if you like that way of rephrasing it, which would address your concern. If what the person did is wrong, then it will teach that person that it was wrong. Yeah. Right? So, now, if you think that this claim is true, let's put it on the blue side. So, I'm going to move my bear here, because I'm still in the middle, but I believe that this, this claim is true. Good. So, we... Who's, uh, so you pro presumably you agree with it since you wrote it. <laughs> so we all agree that it's true. On its own, just that claim, would that support the fact that public shaming is a reasonable form of teaching people a lesson? Because now 
we just agreed on the fact that it can teach people a lesson. The question now is, given that it can teach people a lesson, is it a reasonable way to do it? The thing is, when you're shaming people for doing something wrong, it's indirectly saying, don't try. Don't risk. Don't attempt anything a little bit out of your, your, your little square, your little box, comfort zone. Like it's saying, you did something wrong. And if they didn't know, if this was their first time, the message coming across is, don't try because you're going to fail. If all the time you're trying something new because usually when you try something new, you're not going to get it the first time. So instead of publicly shaming somebody, you're saying, all right, this is what you did wrong. How do we fix it? Trying to, to communicate, trying to build off of this mistake, this mistake as a lesson, but not public shaming being the lesson. Mm -hmm. We can teach them that it was wrong. So the, the inference from that's the main conclusion mm -hmm. that it's the reason a reasonable form of teaching. Them. I think that it and it is situation dependent, but like let's give the example of someone being racist. Should you publicly shame someone for being racist? I think absolutely because that is obviously unacceptable behavior from anyone, no matter like who you are, being racist is inappropriate. So I think that that's just one of those things that like, I think that there are certain things that you just can't publicly shame because it's inappropriate. There are certain things that you can publicly shame because it's always inappropriate, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that you know are bad, you can talk your whole life they're bad, so you shouldn't do them. Yeah. And it's like an F, it's like, it's bad and it's, you can't, there's no other opinion really on it. Yeah. So all you bad. Yeah, so it's... I don't really think that people will not say that. I think the course should be an option. I just don't think it should be a super long end. I like... I think that's what I think. My, my position is that you absolutely be allowed to vote at the age of 18, or at the age of 16, pardon me. But I fundamentally disagree with the prospect or idea of forcing people to take a course or to pass a test or anything of that sort in order to be able to vote. Because I think this idea of voting is we kind of have this idea of universal suffrage, right? At least among adults. Um, if they're a citizen and they can prove that, then they can vote. Um, and that's the system. And there's no discrimination in terms of whether that person is mentally capable to vote. There's no discrimination in terms of whether that person assesses the media correctly. There's no discrimination on whether that person is leftist or rightist. Um, there's no discrimination if that person has... Well, absolutely, but I think that any sort of discrimination based on one person's ideas or their so-called ability to vote um, in allowing them to vote goes fundamentally against the idea of democracy in that democracy is to allow citizens to make decisions for their country. Like yeah. choosing a specific zygote to like be your child is one thing, but that's a possible child that you could have had in the first place. Yeah. Just picking a zygote. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas gene editing is like specifically changing it's like something. It's sense. something it's that like couldn't have happened. Yeah, like changing their eye color. Changing their eye color. Monster. You wouldn't have had that kid yeah. in the past. Yeah. Yeah. And like, as a parent, like, you should be okay with whatever child you're given. Just want to make sure. Yeah. Like, so, like, what you get, it's, it's your child. So like. With that claim in mind, like, <laughs> might, you're, like, you're wiggling over a little yeah. bit. Yeah, like okay, it, it okay. kind of like, like it it's opens the gate to designer babies. Yes, it, it, yeah, you're right. Yeah, there's that risk. Whatever the people wages that we're driving, so we should have like the same thing our dads have. So I think like if we're given so much responsibility, we should like, based on the reasons, we should have a say. You know? Um, and he's, he's running around yeah, the yeah. However, I'm still, yeah, I'm still yeah. 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 And maybe that doesn't matter too. Maybe it's just a matter of being right. Like 
and it also depends on your perception. So I could be a con artist, right? And everybody else would be like, well, you're doing something bad. And I'm like, well, are like corporations that are out there that are legal, are they doing the right thing too? And I could use that as a defense and think that I'm the good guy here and I'm being victimized. Even though in someone else's perception, I'm conning them for like, millions of dollars but there are there are businesses like it's like they're inherently doing something that's bad for human nature so something as simple as putting so much sugar in our food it's it's been known to be bad but they're making money off of it so why would you stop they're gonna go broke if you stop if you decide sugar you can't put sugar in your food anymore so they're inherently making this decision to continue doing this bad thing for the money so they're being rewarded with it every single day with millions of dollars but that's and it's their choice to make regardless of what people are telling them but that's, again, that's a different thing than just one person deciding, you know what, I'm going to be this person. You can it's so many not black levels. and white. So, it's not, yeah. it's not. It depends on what's at stake. Is it ever black and white? No. <laughs> yeah, nothing, no. nothing, nothing black and white. Yeah. Yeah.